It seemed almost fitting that at the end of 2019, I took a trip down to New York City, went into the hospital, and had a third stent placed into my heart. I thought I'd talk a little bit about what that was like and how different it is for me this time. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, William Hearn, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Twice previously, I had found myself in the hospital dealing with a heart issue. The first time, I discovered that I'd had a heart attack at least a week before. The second time was me knowing something was wrong and being verified by my cardiologist and getting another stent put in. This third time had its own interesting attributes. I've described my heart attack as like wearing a jacket of pain all over the top of my body, like there were pinpricks hitting me from every direction, and being unable to move very quickly without feeling winded and lost. By the time I stumbled into a clinic, I was in pretty bad shape. My second stent was in some ways more concerning because I knew I wasn't feeling right and both my primary care doctor and my cardiologist didn't think there was too much wrong until I went to an emergency room, demanded to be investigated, and they found a blockage. This third time involved me again not feeling quite right and demanding that somebody go in there and get things fixed. Talking about one's medical situation is always very personal for a lot of folks, but I've always been somebody to overshare, and I think there's something to be learned. So here's how it went down for me. Starting about four months before the procedure, I started to notice that my blood pressure was going up a little bit, and I was starting to feel those weird feelings again. Weird feelings, I realize, is not descriptive enough. When you're talking about circulation, you're talking about a system that goes throughout your body, and you grow a sense of how it feels, where headaches come from, where aches and pains come from. You just learn it like a piece of music. And if you pay enough attention to it, you notice where some of the notes are wrong. In my case, I had a scattered number of places around my body, the bottom of my left foot, the top of my right shoulder, a part of my neck, a part of my inner thigh, where every once in a while I could tell something wasn't quite right. It wasn't a sharp pain, more like a pinprick, and they would all get it in succession, usually within a few minutes of each other. I didn't like that. And it was something that reminded me of the time before my second stent. At the time, I was going through cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab is kind of like a really inquisitive gym. They hook an EKG up to you, make you run on the treadmill, and go through a whole variety of exercises. And a medically trained staff keeps an eye on you, gives you lifestyle advice, and generally helps you work back towards understanding your body. I was doing this Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and any kind of concern I had about my heart was quickly allayed because I could talk to a doctor and show them my EKG and my blood pressure three times a week, and they assured me nothing was really going off the rails. Cardiac Rehab, by the way, is a fantastic program. I can't recommend it enough. You work with folks after some sort of medical malady to figure out how you're going to live your life from this point forward. They help you get back on track, work through your feelings, work through your plans and your exercises, and then send you off after about five or six months with a new way to look at your diet, your lifestyle, and your energy. But the fact remained that as one month turned into two, I started to notice those weird feelings were happening more and more. My blood pressure started to go up, which was pretty strange considering the amount of medications I was on. 
so my doctor increased a few of them, which put it down a little bit. The day before the annual Internet Archive event, I went to the hospital. I checked myself into an emergency room just to make sure nothing strange or concerning was on the menu. They gave me, if not a clean bill of health, a stable one, and I was able to get out and do the show the very next day. Finally, though, four months into this experience of knowing that my body was telling me it wasn't happy, but nothing obviously medical popping up, I started to do something that I'm relatively good at. I started to turn the heat up on everybody. I scheduled time with my cardiologist. I explained that I really, really wanted to be looked at. And I told people around me to keep a close eye on my behavior and to let me know if anything changed about me from them observing me. Ultimately, my cardiologist scheduled an angioplasty, and I knew that I was going to go in and have my heart looked at. And here, I think it helps to understand my state of mind through all this. As I've said before, the last couple of times I've been on the table, I've really not been that worried about not making it out. Not so much that I thought it might not happen, but that if it did, I was comfortable with everything I had done being my entire story. Fifty years is not the longest of lifespans, but I've enjoyed what I got, and I really couldn't complain. That said, I wanted to avoid a situation where stubbornness or failing to speak up for how I felt and what I wanted, everything wrapping up sooner than it should have. And let me be clear about this third event. What I was complaining about was a quality of life issue. My energy was flagging, I was feeling strange pains, and I was concerned and nervous about it. I'd lie in bed and worry that maybe this was the last night, and had I put everything away, and had I cleaned up after myself, leaving some sort of coda to my life that would be a neatly wrapped package in a bow. That is not a healthy state of mind to stay in night after night. But in history, there have been plenty of people who have lived this way, with some sort of pain or syndrome racking their body, and them not being sure what it is, and trying to take the most of every day because they're not sure what this great cloudy black unknown within them is going to do to them in the future. I was and am incredibly lucky that I had people I could call, folks I could reach out to, things I could look up to try to understand what I was going through. When they first operated on me in Australia in 2017, they indicated to me that they had fixed one of my blockages. I didn't like the phrase, one of your blockages, but that's what they had done. The general policy was that dealing with a person with multiple blockages in their heart, it was best to go for the one that had caused the problems and let the other ones stay for now. Adding more stents at one time was adding more complications, more opportunity for things to go wrong. It was just best to move in stages. I've understood better that I had four problem areas on my heart four arteries that were of varying degrees of blocked from 100% down to about 50 or 60%. Over time, they were blocking up further and further to the point that one of the ones that was about 70 had gone up to 99%, and one of the ones at 50 was inching up every month. My medications were helping things, but they weren't curing anything. My attempts to change my diet weren't affecting the speed at which my arteries were blocking. An angioplasty is a procedure where they put a catheter into your circulatory system to have a look at how your heart's doing. They take photographs, they look at it closer, and they have the option, while they're in there, 
to add a device or do a procedure called a ballooning if needed. The time between when my doctor said it was a good idea to try this out and when I did it was about a week. That week had two very different feelings running through my day. The first one was incredible frustration that I'd have to go through all this again, that I would have to be looked at and opened and people would be going around and probably put more metal into me and just how I was going to try to have a normal life when I was constantly being sidelined by these stupid medical problems. But the other feeling was one of elation that I'd been listened to, that somebody who really knew what they were doing was going to do the procedure and that I would, by all accounts, come out happier, healthier, and with a much better chance of living a pretty full life. To give you an idea of the hands that I was in, the doctor who did my procedure does an average of 1,500 of them every year. To do this, they have to have a vaguely assembly line approach. I arrived at 7.30 in the morning at Mount Sinai Heart. I filled out some forms, and within about 20 minutes, I was sitting in a small booth in a waiting room. A person asked me some questions about myself, verified all of my statistics, asked me a little bit about my history. They took some blood. They put me into a gown, asked me if I had any questions. I really didn't. And then put me on a gurney. I was then wheeled on this gurney into the cath lab, which is actually seven or eight operating rooms, all with different staffs running each particular space with the main doctor moving between them across the day. As luck would have it, I was the first. Being that this was the third time I've done this, my relationship with the doctors was markedly different. I knew what options they had for going into my body. For the record, they can go in in a spot on your wrist just below your thumb. They can go in through your groin, and they can go in through your ankle. Of the three, I'm a major fan of the wrist entry, also known as the radial. I had pretty strong opinions about in what position I should be lying for my own comfort, and I recognized when each phase happened. The uh, splashing of antiseptic on different joints for possible entry, the arrangement of the video screen, which was showing my heart beating, the kinds of questions the doctors would ask about potential medical interactions, which had been asked six times before, but which they were asking one more time, just to be sure. And then doctors explaining to me what drugs they were putting into me, what was going to go on, and what to watch out for. And that everything would be okay. People always seem surprised when they find out that you're awake through the entire operation. But on the other hand, they give you fentanyl, which is your little drug buddy when you're going through an operation while still awake. Fentanyl has multiple effects, including pain relief. One thing is that it makes you very zen about what's going on. I was able to coherently answer questions. The relationship between doctors and patients in this situation is almost like mechanics having a talking car. I know they're working on me. I know they're in me doing stuff. But I'm not overly concerned. And I'm mildly interested. At this point, it was my third time watching my own heart being worked on on a screen and being repaired. The whole thing takes about 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on how complicated you are. In my case, I was a little complicated. Two procedures were done to me. One of them was a ballooning. This is where the end of the catheter expands a little bit to make a little more space in your artery. And the other was a stent placement where they actually do put a metal cage into that part of your artery so that it's held open. Again, this had been done to me twice before and was now being done to an area that everybody knew about for a couple years and had just grown to a point of needing attention. After the operation was done, the doctor moved on to the next room, and the rest of the staff cleaned me up and got me out of there and wheeled me off to a recovery area, which was essentially seven or eight beds in a room separated by curtains, where we all had water 
and all had a chance to relax in bed for a few hours. Somewhere in there, they did a few tests to make sure that I wasn't having any sort of reactions. They made me do one walk around the hospital floor just to show I was competently responding. And then within three and a half hours of the end of this procedure, they sent me out the door. Being driven, I want to point out. I was home before it got dark. I absolutely don't want to live a life which is going from scare to scare to being concerned to crying out for getting help and then getting the help and everything returning to normal for a few months before I need more help. I don't want to live that kind of life. Ideally, we have gotten to the last of my quote-unquote problem areas, my lifetime of building up cholesterol blockage in my arteries is hopefully cleared out and I'm ready for the next chapter. It's been a little more than a week since that procedure and I'm trying not to do what I've done every other time, which is send myself back into the hospital a week or two later because I'm worried, because I don't know how these feelings are. The third time around, I'm much more aware that putting a piece of metal in my heart does make me feel a little weird for a week or two. So I'm keeping an eye on things, but I'm not panicking. I've been down this road. I know what to do with it. Even though it was a one-day in-and-out procedure, I still have a new stent. My heart has to adjust and there's still some healing to do. But what now? Well, ever since the first heart attack, I have been on a straight-line trajectory to get rid of deaths, both financial and physical, to take all sorts of projects that I didn't know I was going to do, or which should be handled by others, or which shouldn't be under my direct purview, and ensuring they get out there. Magazines to museums, hardware and software to the Internet Archive and, and other locations, and making sure that I myself live as light and as focused a life as possible and on the things that I care about. That continues. That has gone very well. When I was wheeled into that operating room, I owned 10% of the physical items that I had for my first procedure. I had moved from a home with unstable heat and temperature to a full apartment that had the space and cleanliness to ensure I wouldn't pick up something else in my travels. I rest more now. I take time more now. There's not really going to be a massive sea change in my lifestyle. I've done what I can do. Instead, I just want to focus on the paths that I've chosen, to ingest all sorts of material to teach others how to do that, to give others education and to collaborate, to share some of the load of things that I took on for myself, and to walk away from situations of stress and needless conflict, to stick with what I want to do, living a life that's a positive instead of a negative. My next episodes will be on stories and experiences, but I just wanted you to know the perspective of how this feels now. As I heal from this operation, an operation I walked into and then walked away from, I get to feel just how lucky I am that the kind of job I have is exactly what I want to do, that the people I work with and the people I collaborate with and the people I communicate with online are the kinds of folks I look forward to seeing every day. I feel listened to. I feel respected, loved. And I can't ask for more other than to hope that I get enough time to help make others feel that way and guide and support them where what could at one time feel like a catastrophe and a great unknown simply becoming a straightforward maintenance on a nice, rainy Monday morning. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Forrest Fuqua, Mark Pilgrim, 
and Scott McGrady, as well as the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere for supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Obviously, there will be a cost involved in this operation. But I had made a mistake in May of this year where I went to an emergency room, had them look at me, had them verify what needed to be done, then got myself both run with an expensive stress test, then transported at great cost down to New York City. This time, I was recommended for the procedure, walked in, got the procedure, and walked out. My total medical costs in May was about $6,500. I'm hoping it'll be less than half of that this time around. No other major costs or debts have come in. Everything seems to be stable, and it's just managing payments to the IRS for the foreseeable future. My statistics tell me that about 1,500 to 2,000 people listen to this podcast. That's my audience. I'm very happy so many people take an interest. Some people come in through Patreon, while others syndicate it on Apple iTunes, on Libsyn, and on YouTube. If you're connected through something other than Patreon, and you wish to make contributions towards this debt repayment I'm doing, my PayPal is jason at textfiles.com. And if you wanted to make payment arrangements of some sort through another means, you can use that email address to communicate with me or to talk about anything, really. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to stories.